Um, the title of the message this morning is I Speak Jesus. So let's turn in our Bibles to Proverbs 18, verse 21. Yes. Are you guys pumped this morning? <laughs> My husband, Blake Bradley, brings the Holy Spirit energy, <laughs> does he not? <laughs> People ask me all the time, they're like, is he like that at home? And the answer is yes. <laughs> There's slightly less jumping, though, because <laughs> we do live in a tiny house, and it is up on blocks, and that just wouldn't be good for our foundation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that man, unless he's tired or sick or stressed, he's in a much higher gear than, gear than I am. I always tease him. You know how people have those mugs that say fueled by Jesus and coffee? That would be the title of his autobiography. <laughs> but um, I, I'm a lot different than my husband. <laughs> um, how many of y'all are different than your spouse? Yep, same. It's pretty common. <laughs> I'm a Bradley by marriage. <laughs> okay? We don't share any DNA. That's illegal in most states, <laughs> but I do share uh, my home with two miniature Bradleys who do share his DNA, so I guess what I'm saying is pray for me. <laughs> Ask the Lord to give me more energy. <laughs> Amen. No, I'm kidding. I love my family so much, and I love my husband. He's the best man who ever lived except for Jesus. Hashtag change my mind. Hashtag you can't. We will have been married 21 years this month. I know it's really hard to believe because we look so young. <laughs> but uh, we're very different in a lot of ways, but we're very similar in some. Um, one of the ways that we are similar is that we are both verbal processors. We love to talk, don't we, babe? I mean, we, we talk about everything. <laughs> I know a lot of marriages, it's not like that. It's like one person likes to talk more than the other person, but we both like to talk a lot, and we will dissect a subject. We will talk it up one side, down the other, flip it, reverse it, all those things. If there's a problem, yo, we'll solve it. Check out the hook while our DJ revolves it. We love to talk. Um, and those two miniature Bradleys that I mentioned before, they have his DNA, but also mine, so they just didn't have a chance. Like, on the Punnett Square of Bradleyness, remember Punnett Squares from science class? They got two capital T dominant talkative traits. So there be some talking going on in our house. And our youngest, Willow, she's four, and she's currently enrolled in Bradley 101, which means she's learning to wait her turn to talk. So it's like all day long, Willow, wait your turn to talk. Baby, do you hear me talking? Wait your turn. Honey, do you hear your sister telling me a story? Just wait your turn to talk. Willow, it's rude to talk over people while they're talking. But the problem is none of us really wait our turn to talk. <laughs> so... Like, you know how you're supposed to teach your child by example? Circle back to point one, pray for me, <laughs> okay? Um, because we just fill up our house with words, and um, it doesn't take long to do because we do live in a tiny house, so we just fill it up with this cloud of words. But lately, the Lord has been dealing with Blake and I about our words a lot. He's been dealing with us about our mouth, um, because we kind of have this unwritten rule in our house because we recognize everyone's need to talk about everything. And it is, you can talk about anything you want to in our house. If something's bothering you, if you're irritated with somebody, somebody hurts you, you're annoyed with the situation, you can get it off your chest. But with the understanding that we're going to go behind and we're going to clean up the mess afterwards, right? And what I mean by that is, we're going to go behind and we're going to say, you know what, those are my feelings, those are the facts as I see them, however, what's the truth? Like, what's the truth of the word of God? Because the truth of the word of God trumps the facts. We don't live by sight, we live by faith. And every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord is our bread. And so we're going to go behind, we're going to do that, we're going to say, Jesus, how do you feel about this? Holy Spirit, how are you convicting me? about this situation and about my words, and I'm going to repent where I need to repent, let you change my mind about it, surrender it to you, and then because you've brought conviction, Lord, I know that with your conviction comes grace. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the Lord never brings conviction without the grace to restore us. His conviction is always for the purpose of restoring us under righteousness. We exchange our filthy rags for a robe of righteousness. If conviction is present in the room, if he, he is convicting you of something, you can guarantee that his grace is sufficient for you. That's why we come boldly to the throne of grace, to receive help in our time of need. And man, when it comes to my mouth, I need help. But that's the idea anyway, so we're going to do this thing where we clean it up afterwards. However, we don't really always do that. We do sometimes. I mean, it's like our high value, but it's not really a core value. You know the difference between a high value and a core value? A high value is what you want to be. A core value is what you really are. Uh -huh. And so that's what we strive for, right? But we don't always hit the mark with that. So sometimes what it looks like is we just are getting things off of our chest and we're just spewing all this vitriol into the atmosphere of our home. All this bitterness and anger and resentment and judgment and backbiting and gossip and evil speaking and nitpicking. Come on, can we get real this morning? Anybody? Anybody? And we don't clean it up. And it just hangs like a cloud of negativity in our household. And we just walk around in it. And our kids just walk around in it. And it affects us and it affects them and we were doing that recently it really wasn't that long ago we just got on this subject that we were mutually annoyed about this issue and we start going on this spiral about it and oh man once you start spiraling it just keeps going and going and going your words will take you down a path and we start bringing up old stuff that supposedly under the blood supposedly we've forgiven we've moved past and we're still bringing it up talking about it how horrible it was and this person and that person and blah 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 and then we just went to bed. We let the sun go down on our anger, you know? And um, about three or four in the morning, I woke up and I felt a darkness. Now it was dark, but I'm talking about a darkness. And I felt this heaviness and this anxiety. Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night and you felt that? Yeah, what you need to do is you need to start praying in the spirit. You know why? Because you're tired and you don't know what to pray yet. So you pray in the spirit. You pray in tongues because the Holy Spirit knows what to pray. The Holy Spirit prays the perfect will of God. When you don't know what to pray, pray in the spirit. And then you need to get your Bible out. You know why? Because you're under attack. And when you're under attack, you need to fight. And when you're fighting, you need a weapon. And this is the sword of the spirit. And you need to pray the word of God. His word does not return to him void. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will remain forever. His word is so mighty. It is a two-edged sword. Amen. Well, I didn't do that. I just woke up, sensed what was going on, got scared, prayed a little bit, and went to bed. Woke up the next morning, and um, me and Blake are back at it. Because you know what? We're getting ready for the day, and it is chaos in 280 square feet with four people getting ready for the day. And, man, we just picked up right where we left off, didn't we, babe? We just start nitpicking this situation. We're going around this mountain. And all of a sudden, I remembered what had happened that night. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit came upon me, and I said, oh, T.O. Coach, I started to tell Blake what had happened overnight, and I said, I think that the Lord wants us to repent right now. I think we need to surrender our mouth, and we need to give it over to the Lord, and we need to be quiet. And Blake said, yeah, that's exactly what we need to do. I feel it too. And Blake started praying. We started repenting, and we felt this heaviness lift off of us and lift out of our house because we had surrendered our mouths to the Lord and repented. And I was reminded of what the Lord said in Proverbs 18.21 in his word. Let's go there. It says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. In other words, your words are so powerful. Your words are so powerful to either bring life or to kill, to destroy. And the talkative person, amen, that's me, I don't know if that's you, but the talkative person will reap the consequences. We reap the consequences of every word that we speak. They can either build us up or tear us down. Words are so powerful. 
to create our inner world and to affect our outer world. With one word, a mother can soothe her crying baby. With three words, that same mother can strike fear in the heart of her misbehaving child. Mama, you know what three words I'm talking about, right? First name, middle name, last name. Vivian Grace Bradley. Insert your child's name here. I assume you know all of it. That's all it takes. One word can get our adrenaline pumping. Fire! We're either running to it or we're running away from it, right? What about the, these two words? You remember this? Pop quiz! Whew. Our words are so powerful. Five, five words or less can change your life. Like, I love you. It's not you. It's me. Will you? Will you? marry me. I do. Congratulations, it's a boy. Congratulations, it's a girl. I'm sorry, you have cancer. Words can change your life. Your life can change like that. Language is so powerful. Um, researchers say that we can't even think critically about something without the language to describe it. I recently saw this speech given by a woman who had left North Korea, the communist dictatorship of North Korea, and she said it was so common for her and her family to see dead, star or star starving people who were dying on the side of the road and for them to not even think twice about helping them. They wouldn't help. They would just walk on by. And she said, it never occurred to me to help another human being. And she didn't attribute this solely to the oppression of the state, but she said, in my language, if there is a word for compassion, I didn't know it. And it wasn't until she learned English and she learned what compassion meant that she said she could even think critically about that situation. Words are so powerful. They create worlds. They bring life or they destroy. And I don't know about you, but my words are often lacking in bringing life. My words are not always full of life. I mean, I think that the Apostle Paul could have been talking about me when he wrote to the church of Ephesus in chapter 4. I don't have a slide for this, but this is what he said. He said, let no foul or polluting language, nor evil word, nor unwholesome or worthless talk ever come out of your mouth, except the speech that is good and beneficial to the spiritual progress of others. I don't know about you, but I don't always speak in a way that is beneficial to the spiritual progress of others. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Can you grieve the Holy Spirit by your words? Yes, you can. He says, let all bitterness, indignation, wrath, passion, rage, bad temper, resentment, anger, animosity, quarreling, brawling, clamor, slander, evil speaking, gossip, abusive, blasphemous language be put away from you, be banished from you. Now, hey, if you're starting to feel convicted already, good news. His grace is here. His grace is sufficient for us. Amen. That's what he died for. He died for that grace to come to us, mortal men who need it so bad. Don't you need his grace every day? I need him so bad. And he doesn't hold any of himself back from me. The Lord is here to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to restore us unto righteousness with him. But, you know, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, I don't ever speak curses or backbiting comments or ju judgment or gossip or, you know, bitterness or complaining. Well, that's all right. I'll just preach this message to myself. How about? <laughs> okay. And you can sit there and feel sorry for me and stay bound if you want, or we can all... <laughs> Humble ourselves before the Lord this morning and see what he has to say. Let him search our heart and let him come and, and touch the coal to our mouths like he did for Isaiah. Amen.
Does the Lord care about our mouth? Well, according to Strong's Concordance, there are 452 scriptures about the mouth, 109 about the tongue, 527 about our words, 499 about speech and speaking. I think God has something to say about speech. In Romans 12, Paul urged the Romans to present their body, their body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. Does that include our mouth? Yeah, it does. It includes all of our faculties. But for some reason, we do not like to surrender our mouth to the Lord. We don't want him to have control over it. But man, we don't want to have control over it either. <laughs> it's, one of the, it's one of those things when you break up with somebody and you're like, I don't want to date you, but I don't want anybody else to date you either. <laughs> it's just like that. <laughs> Sorry, I have to tell jokes because this gets heavy, right? Um, <laughs> I started talking about this in first service and it was looking all really heavy. <laughs> um, <laughs> James, really, I like the way that James puts it in his epistle. He talks about how small our tongue is, but how powerful it is. That if we could just control our tongue, then we could control everything. <laughs> it's so true. Um, he says in chapter 3, verse 2, he says, Indeed, we all make many mistakes. Praise God, amen, James. For if we could control our tongue, we would be perfect and could control ourselves in every other way. He said we can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. Now, if you've ever tacked up a horse, you know what he's talking about. A horse, you put a bit, it's a piece of metal like this, in its mouth like this. And that bit is attached to a bridle, and the bridle's just there to hold the bit in place and to attach it to some reins. And the rider holds the reins, and all the rider has to do is just barely move those reins like this. That's all you have to do. And that moves the bit in the horse's mouth. Even a bit, even a horse that's not tamed will obey when you start moving that bit, you know, because the bit moves its head. And wherever a horse's head is set, wherever a horse's face is set, that is the direction that they will go. It's the same with our life. If you truly want Jesus to have the reins of your life, you will surrender your mouth to him. Why? Because he will put his words in your mouth. Why are we speaking our words when we could be speaking the word of God? Why? Why am I speaking all this vitriol when I could be speaking words from the throne of heaven? Holy Spirit breathed words. And he will set my face in the direction of his word. And that is where my life will go. He goes on to compare it to a rudder on a boat. And a rudder on a boat, a rudder compared to the size of the boat is such a small thing. And it's connected to the helm. And the captain has the helm and all he has to do is turn that helm. And when he turns it, that rudder turns. And even in the midst of a storm, a boat will go in the direction that the captain wants it to go. You want to have peace in the midst of the storms of your life? You want Jesus to come and move in the storms of your life and direct the course of your ship? Surrender your mouth to Jesus. Amen? He goes on um, in verse 5. He says, in the same way the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It is set. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. Tell us how you really feel, James. <laughs> Man. But he's he's... He's telling the truth. Can you not ruin your life with a few words? How many relationships have been ruined? How many marriages have been ruined? Jobs lost? Reputations tarnished by our mouths? Amen? He says it's set on fire by hell itself. I don't want my tongue to be set on fire by hellfire. I want it to be set on fire by the holy fire from the altar of heaven. When Isaiah stood before the throne of God, he said, Woe am I, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. In the presence of God, you have to get real. If you haven't got real with God, can I encourage you to press in to the presence of God because you get real, real quick. When you stand in the presence of a holy God, 
you can't help but confess the reality of your situation. But there's good news. Isaiah was convicted. But with conviction comes what? Grace. And the angel went to the altar and he got the coal with the tongs and he brought it over to Isaiah's lips and he touched it to Isaiah's mouth and cleansed him from all unrighteousness. And that's what God wants to do to us today. You know why? Because God's next big power move was to say, who will go for us? And that's what he's saying today. Who will go for us? And Isaiah, because he'd been cleansed, he was able to say, here am I, Lord, send me. Without hesitation, and that should be the cry of our heart. Here am I, Lord, send me. Put your word in my mouth. Because you see, our mouth, the word of God says that the spirit, the living water, it's, it's, it's like a river. On the inside of us and it springs up and it flows out and everywhere it goes it brings life it brings life but watch what he said he continues to talk he says people can tame all kinds of animals birds reptiles fish but no one can tame the tongue it is restless and evil full of deadly poison sometimes it praises the Lord and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God and so blessing and cursing come from the same mouth and he says how can that be brothers and sisters how can that be how can you get fresh water and salt water from the same source but that's how it happens with us we be salty sometimes we be salty. You know, you can't drink salt water. It will kill you. It is poisonous to drink salt water. That's why they say of the ocean, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. You can't drink ocean water. It's too salty. It will kill you. And sometimes I think that's what our life is like. Our world is like words, words, words everywhere, but none of them giving life. But the Holy Spirit in you is a well of living water springing up to eternal life and it is meant he is meant to flow out of you and purify you from the inside out amen bringing life everywhere you go but we don't want to pollute our well with our words amen unless you have lived a very charmed life indeed you you know firsthand the power of words to cause harm that deadly poison, you know that sting of that deadly poison. Who here could say that you've never been hurt by somebody's words? That old adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, lie from hell. It's a lie. You can punch me in the face and that bruise will go away. That sting will dissipate after a while. But words sometimes can leave an indelible sting upon our psyche that can take a lifetime to heal. But praise God, God can heal them. Amen? He can. But let's talk about it. Let's talk about our words that hurt, these, this slanderous gossip words. Man, we love gossip. We love it. Nothing can perk up our flesh like three little words. Have you heard? <laughs> what? <laughs> Even if we don't want to know, we're like, hmm what though <laughs> the bible calls it tender morsels in the book of proverbs in the same chapter chapter 18 that we started with verse 7 it says a fool's mouth is his ruin and his lips are a snare to his soul the words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels they go down into the inner parts of the body you know, that pie, that cake, those cookies, those brownies, those potato chips, they are tender morsels. They taste real good, but they don't do your body any favors. <laughs> Gossip be like that. It tastes real good, but it doesn't do the body of Christ any favors. Now listen, this is a part of the message where I give a disclaimer. I'm not talking about exposing true injustice and abuse. By all means, expose that. Okay, bring light, let the Lord shine his light on that. Too long throughout history, these same scriptures that I'm sharing with you today have been used to demonize people who have been abused and are trying to bring light to the situation. Amen? That's not what I'm talking about. You tracking with me? I'm talking about run-of-the-mill gossip. I'm talking about when you just latch on to someone's misfortune 
or someone's mistake and you want to share it because it makes you feel good about yourself, right? Yeah, um, that's what I'm talking about. Probably because we're jealous, right? I just latch on to somebody's mistake and I just want to spread it because it makes me feel good because I'm jealous. That's the truth of the situation. Amen. Um, but we need to be done with all that, church. That's not what our mouths were created for. Our mouths were created to praise the Lord and to preach the gospel. To preach the gospel. To speak his word. To give life. That's what our mouth was created for. If you have an issue with gossip, can I just tell you, we all do. Okay? Let's get real. What you need to do is this. First of all, surrender your mouth. This is, these, this is for all of us. I'm preaching to myself. Remember that? Remember I told you I was preaching to myself? Okay. We need to surrender our mouth and stop being a person that brings tender morsels for people to feast on. Okay? Repent and, bring, and, and surrender our mouth. Number two, um, when somebody comes to you with a tender morsel and they say, have you heard? And your flesh goes, ooh, I really want to listen. Five words. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Say something good about the person. Believe the best. Understand that they need mercy. And woo, don't you also. Don't I also. So let's show them mercy, right? Because whatever judgment we dole out is the judgment that we have, will receive. Amen. But you know what? If you, if you just go ahead and, and hear that, you just take in that tender morsel, whether you want to or not, Here's what you can do with it, okay? You become a vault. You know what I mean by that? The story ends with me. The story ends with you. Become a vault. David said this. He said in Psalm 141, Set a guard, Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men who work iniquity, and do not let me eat of their morsels. And then you surrender it to God and you say, Jesus, I don't want to know this person by the flesh. I want to know them according to your spirit. Who are they under the blood? Because that's how I want men to know me. That's how the Lord knows me. And that's how the Lord knows them. And so that's how we need to know them. Amen? According to the spirit. See, Jesus is purifying the mouth of his bride. Because he has a purpose for our mouth. And we need to constantly let him purify our hearts because really the words of our mouth are an issue of our heart. Jesus said this in Matthew 12. He said that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Matthew 12, 34, he said, Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word that men speak, they will give an account of it on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. Say law. I don't think that there is a section of scripture that puts the fear of the Lord in me personally more than that section of scripture because I say a lot of dumb things. <laughs> I am an idle speaker. If there's silence, I just want to fill it up. <laughs> you know? But praise God, our words can be under the blood. Amen? And then when we stand before the throne of grace, that's all the Lord is going to see is the blood of Jesus. He's not going to see our words. Okay, but we got to surrender him to him. We got to get real about it. Amen. Whew. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is not just about don't do this, don't do that. The kingdom of heaven is about why are you doing that when you were created for so much more? Why are you speaking like that when you could be speaking words that are God breathed? You could be agreeing with the very words spoken by the creator of the universe and speaking them out over your situation in your life. You see, your mouth was made to speak the word of God, and the enemy knows this. And I am convinced that the enemy is not so much after your life as he is after the word of the Lord in your mouth. You know why I know that? Because if your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, there is not much that the enemy can do about that. Amen? 
Death, where is your sting? Did we not just sing that today? Death is the ultimate graduation for a Christian. They are now in the presence of God. That's not what the enemy is after so much as he is after the word of God in your mouth. Because the word of God in your mouth is the power to save. It's not your word in your mouth. It's his words in your mouth that is the power to save. It's, your wor it's the word of the Lord in your mouth that might mean the difference between somebody else's name being written in the Lamb's book of life. That's why it's so important, church. That we let God have this flame. We let God have the reins, the bit in our mouth. We got to surrender it to him. It is life or death. Jesus. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. I'm going to say this. It's a commandment to preach. We need to get over the word preach. It's not just a role. It's just not just a position. I understand some people are in a role and have that position and have that title. But to preach the gospel is a commandment unto the disciples of Jesus. He told his disciples in Mark 16, go into all the word, world and preach the gospel to every creature. That word preach is the Hebrew word caruso, and it just means to proclaim, to publicly tell something with due emphasis. Are you his disciple? Then you are supposed to caruso this gospel. Did he not say, if you do not confess me before men, I will not confess you before the Father? Did he not say, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy? How can they believe unless they hear? How can they hear unless there is a preacher? Why do we think that the gospel has to be any more grandiose than just our testimony? I was dead and I'm alive again. You gotta tell me you can't tell people that? I'm not into this idea that certain people can't preach the gospel. I'm not into it because all it is is my testimony of who Jesus is and what he's done for me. I was dead and I'm alive again. I was lost in my sin. I had a debt that I couldn't pay and he came along and he paid a debt that he didn't know. And now I give him my life and I become the righteousness of God in Christ. I was a lost sheep and he left the 99 and came and found me. That's the gospel. You going to tell me you can't preach that? Who told you you can't preach that? Who told you you can't preach? Who told you? I'm serious today. Who told you that? What, you've made some mistakes? Well, get in line. So is everybody in this room. Get in line. So is every preacher that's ever graced a stage. So is every human being in this book except for Jesus. That's what the grace of God is for. That's what the blood of Jesus was shed for. That's what the power of the Holy Spirit is for. To empower you to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. And then, and then the end will come. What you can't preach, you can't preach because you're a woman. Well, so is the woman at the well, and she went and told her entire village. She went and told her, and anyone that would listen, Mary Magdalene was the first to know the good news that Jesus had risen. Do you think that was a mistake, that he appeared to her first? It wasn't. What you don't have a stage, you don't have a platform, you don't have an invitation. Well, Jesus sent his disciples out without a stage or a platform or, or anything, an invitation. He said, preach it to every creature in the highways and the byways. Why do we think we need more than them? We don't need it. What, you're not educated? Well, neither were they. They were tradesmen. They were fishermen. You probably have more education than they do. But you know what? They tarried in the upper room until they were filled with power from on high, the power that raised Christ from the dead. The Holy Spirit, the teacher of all things that teaches us everything, convicts the world of sin and righteousness. They enrolled in the school of the Holy Spirit. And you think he won't give you an education? He will. He will lead you to study his word. He might lead you to do something more formal than that. But when you surrender your mouth, your whole life to Jesus, to the Lord, to the whole, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. He's going to school you. 
Don't even worry about it. He said, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Amen. What, you don't have a speaking gift? Well, guess what? I don't have a gift to sing. Does that mean I can't worship Jesus? Am I disqualified from worship, worshiping Jesus? I can make a joyful noise, praise God. That's all I need is to make a joyful noise. Look, you don't have to have a gift to preach the word of God. We need to stop being impressed by gifts. I'm not impressed by a gift anymore. Jesus isn't impressed by a gift. Gifts are random. They don't have any kind of qualifier or anything. They're irrevocable. They're just given. You know what? You don't need a gift. You just need to surrender your life. I'm not impressed by a gift. I'm impressed by a laid down life. Someone who said, let the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing unto you, God. Whew. Jesus. He said in John chapter 12, John's always doing this. Are guys with me? It's all right if I tell this last point too. All right. This is a really good one. The scripture wrecks me. John's always doing this in his gospel. He was there, by the way. He saw what Jesus did, and in his gospel, he is always telling us what Jesus did. He healed somebody. He performed some miracle. He preached some message. And then he tells us throughout his gospel, and here's how the people responded to it. Some of them left, and some of them believed. And he's doing it again here in John chapter 12 and verse 42. He says, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praises of God. They were afraid. They were afraid. And some of us, it's not so much about how much we talk. It's about how little we talk. It's the fear of man. And today, I break it off of you in the name of Jesus. Skip on down, though. I don't have time to read all of it, but skip on down where it says, verse 49, sorry. Jesus says, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak, and I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. What a contrast between the rulers who believed and Jesus. They were afraid to speak because they loved the praise of men more. Jesus said, this is a command, and it's so important. It's life or death. He said, this command is eternal life. And he knew that by speaking the words of his Father, by obeying and surrendering unto God and obeying and saying exactly what the Father said, that it was going to lead to his death. What a difference. I mostly relate, if I'm real, I mostly relate with those leaders more so than Jesus. Because I am often too fearful to speak the word of God. I am often too fearful to talk about Jesus, to be real about what I believe in certain contexts around certain people. Amen? But I'm learning. I'm learning how to give God the reins. And... Um, I want to tell you this testimony of what God had, has done. God's the healer. Amen. He sent his word and it healed them. And um, I'm learning how important it is to speak the word of the Lord and to not speak what I see. And not to speak what I'm tempted to speak and agree with what I'm attempted to agree with, but to speak the word of God. On May 31st, the mass was found on my ovary. And on June 29th, I saw the oncologist and he told me he didn't know what it was. He'd have to do surgery to remove it. And so I went under the knife on August 2nd and I had no idea what I was going to wake up to. I didn't know, you know, what I was going to be told. I didn't know what all they were going to do. And um, before that, God had given me a word. And he had showed me Numbers 14 where they went into the promised land to spy it out. And how a lot of them came back, the majority of them came back with the report, the land's bad. 
is bad. Let's not go. And um, two of them came back and said, no, the land is good. Let's go take it. And the Lord spoke that word, the land is good, over me. And he said, um, he reminded me that my body is made from the dust. It's the land. And so we started praying that as a family. And uh, on August 2nd, I woke up from surgery and I heard those five words. I'm sorry, you have cancer. But it's okay because we got it all. And um, we're going to biopsy it and find out just what kind it is. And we're going to take... Uh, 11 samples they took and uh, I went home and at first I was really upset you know and then I realized I had a choice I needed to make I I needed to decide whether I was going to agree with the word that the Lord had spoken or not was I going to agree with what he said and um, I remember saying I was still under (laughs) the drugs and I said I'm not having it (laughs) The Lord has spoken. <laughs> um, but he reminded me, he reminded me of Proverbs 4.20 that says that his words are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. And that word health means medicine or cure. It's the Hebrew word marpe. And so every day I would get my whole family in our house and I'd say, it's time for mommy to take her medicine. And I would start reading, and I would read, Malachi 4, the son of righteousness rises with healing in his wings. Jeremiah 17, heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Jeremiah 30, I will restore health to you, and I will heal your wounds. Isaiah 53, by his stripes I am healed. Exodus 23, he will bless my bread and my water and take sickness away from me, and he will fulfill the number of my days. Psalm 103, bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name name. Forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your sins and he heals all your diseases. He rescues my life from the pit. He crowns me with loving kindness. And I would read it. I would take that every day. I would say, mommy's taking her medicine. And all 11 biopsies came back negative. Yeah. That's what I said until they called me in and they said, but we tested the tumor and it's not a tumor that normally occurs on the ovary. It usually occurs somewhere else. So we're really concerned that, well, they didn't say really, they're very conservative when they talk to you, but they, I was really concerned. (laughs) But they said it may have metastasized from somewhere else. So we're gonna do a PET scan. Okay, we're gonna do a PET scan. Okay, I'm back to taking my medicine every day, right? Putting my faith in the word that the Lord had spoken over me. Because I was so tempted, y'all, to speak out of my mouth doubt, okay? And I go in for the PET scan, and they said, well, we didn't find anything where we thought we might, but we did find a mass at the base of your skull. Okay, great. And uh, my good friend Candace, we're not the same person, by the way, (laughs) <laughs> some people thought we were the same person and it's such a wonderful uh, compliment because she's beautiful and she sings like an angel but um, yeah but she went with me and uh, and I was really like just defeated after that meeting and uh, she said get your medicine out give it to me I'm like literally driving down the road and she's like give me your phone <laughs> And I give it to her because we need to get some people around you who will stir up the word of God. Who will not partner with doubt, but will partner with faith in what the Lord has spoken. And um, she started to read those scriptures and it was stirring my faith. And I was like, yeah, that's what God said. That's what he said to me. And so I had to get a CAT scan to see what that thing was at the base of my skull. And so I got a CAT scan and here's what the results said. Are you ready? No evidence of paraganglioma or other mass lesion. No abnormality as previously seen on the PET scan. We hope you enjoyed this message today and that you connected with Jesus. If this message has changed your life and you accepted Jesus as your Savior, you can text the word new life to the number 618-243-0900. We would love to celebrate with you. 
If you would like to give to the ministry of The Roads Church, visit our website, www.theroads.church, for all of our giving options. We would also like to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive notifications of our Sunday live services and to discover more of Pastor Chad's teachings. And now we pray that you experience God's presence throughout your day.